Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and today I'm going to be playing Command Modern Air Naval Operations. It's a game published by Slytherin and Matrix Games. Uh, it's just recently went on Steam. Uh, it's got a bit of a hefty price tag, which has made it a little bit controversial over on Steam, but uh, worth every penny in my opinion uh, for what you get with it. Um, it is a spiritual successor to Harpoon 3, uh, the last of the Harpoon series, and uh, is basically a real-time simulation game uh, which focuses on, as you may guess from the title here, uh, modern air and naval uh, military operations here. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start a new game. And uh, there's a good deal of scenarios in here. Now these are just the scenarios that shipped with the game. There's also dozens upon dozens of user-created scenarios. That might be one of the best strengths of this uh, game, is that it has an incredibly, uh, incredibly flexible scenario editor which basically allows you to create uh, scenarios from any any hypothetical war engagement or anything that you want to create over the last 70 years so it's a great game for basically any modeling any conflict from post world war ii to the modern day into the near future and i believe they're expanding the database to include world war ii weapons and uh, equipment as well so that may uh, progress even further so we've got a lot of options here to choose from. The one I wanted to go ahead and play is called Iron Hand. In this scenario, you play as Russia, intervening in a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan on the side of Armenia. And uh, basically your goal is to reduce the Azerbaijani air defenses so that uh, they can't essentially enforce a no-fly zone over Armenia. Uh, now the scenario and most scenarios come with pretty darn good mission briefings here. There's a general um, overview of the situation here. Basically Azerbaijan and Armenia are disputing a, uh, ter they have a territorial dispute and Azerbaijan's air defense network is large enough so that they could threaten to enforce a no-fly zone here. Um, so all right here. So if we zoom out here, we've uh, immediately gone into the uh, Caucasus region. Um, but apparently, okay, there, just a little bit. Of, come on, just a little bit of lag here um, for a second there. But uh, as you can see here, we're uh, overlooking the Caucasus, and um, this is Armenia right here. Azerbaijan is here, and Azerbaijani air forces. If we actually go ahead and start here for a second. There we go. So you can see here, Azerbaijani forces are in red here, and their air defenses actually extend over almost all of Armenia. This little red circle here shows the extent of the range of the air defense weaponry. So you can see the estimated range of the weapons we know about covers a good deal of, uh, I believe, the Caspian Sea it is here, and uh, also covers almost all of Armenia, this little state here along this, these borders, are Armenia. So they're essentially threatening to enforce a no fly zone over Armenia with their air defenses. If you think about what happened over Ukraine, uh, you will quickly recognize that um, airliners are very vulnerable to air defenses. So um, this game doesn't have a whole lot in the way of graphics. So if this is a game, if you're into, you know, high quality, high fidelity graphics, this is probably not the game for you. But if you're interested in a game that takes a look at a military simulation in a ultra realistic manner and uh, takes a look at, you know, what realistic conflicts look like in the modern day or really anything, I guess, post-World War II, if you consider that the modern day, uh, then this is certainly a game for you. Uh, we can zoom in here with a scroll of the mouse wheel and we can see that... Um, you know, we can just get an estimate on what the enemy forces are in this area. Now, this is not everything. There is a fog of war, which prevents us from seeing absolutely everything that the, that the enemy has. But we do have some intelligence about some things that the enemy does have. So, for example, we can go ahead and click here. We can see this is an SA-2F guideline. Uh, that's a modification or a modern modernized, slightly modernized anyway, SA-2 surface-to-air missile system. You can see here it has 11 uh, estimated targets. Uh, the contact report, there's no information on that. But um, I wonder, you know, we don't really have a whole lot of information on this. Uh, but essentially there's 11 targets in this, uh, in this red area. 
Uh, we might be able to see more. No, not when we zoom in. Okay, so just a bunch of gray here. But essentially, this is a surface-to-air missile. Uh, the range on this one is pretty limited. It can't extend into Armenia here. Uh, now, our mission is actually to destroy the SA-5s. Uh, I believe S maybe SA-4s as well, and then the SA-10s, which are more modern missile systems here. So um, I believe one of these is an SA-5. There we go, an SA-5 Gammon. You can see the SA-5 has a much greater range here, that's represented by this uh, circle. When we click on it, we can see what each weapon's um, radius is in terms of their uh, range. So as you can see here, there's their range. I believe the white represents their radar coverage. So you can see, again, when you click on different units, they have different uh, radar coverage. Uh, there are also other units on here. So as you can see, there's quite a few SA-3s and SA-2s. Uh, those are not our main target because they have much shorter ranges, as you can see here. There are also enemy radar installations, which will uh, extend enemy radar coverage here. You can see these white circular envelopes represent enemy air cover. And um, essentially our goal, as I've said here, to destroy the enemy SA-5s, uh, which are here. And then also we want to destroy enemy SA-10, uh, as well as I think I think the briefing was SA, SA-4s. Um, I can go back in here along the top and I believe I can get the mission briefing here. Scenario description, oh, side briefing. Okay, so enemy forces. Azerbaijan continues to maintain a significant air defense system. They've recently fielded a battalion of S-300 missiles, that's SA-10s, which are likely deployed near Baku, so over here near this peninsula. Uh, their legacy systems include a significant number of early warning radars, SA-2, 3s, 4s, and 5s. Legacy meaning they're older, less well-equipped, and uh, systems as well as fielding a small fleet of MiG-29 fighter jets. So if we scroll down here, your objectives are to destroy all Azerbaijani SA-S-300s, which are the SA-10s, which we can't see any of on the map right now, SA-4s and SA-5 air defense sites without excessive losses to our own forces within three days. So right now we're paused up here. As you can see, we're at 1,900 hours in one second. I uh, fast-forwarded by one second. And uh, we can get a kind of idea of what the enemy might have. Now, as I said, the SA-5 is one of our targets here. So you can see here an SA-5 a gammon battery has quite a few targets. Uh, the number of targets is represent. Oh my goodness, don't zoom in so far. The number of targets is represented by this number here, 22. So there are 22 items in this unit. Um, and if we want, we can actually get a nice little uh, idea of what this weapon system entails. If we actually just click on the type here, uh, we'll get a, a pretty detailed weapon breakdown. This is certainly one of the strengths of this game is the fact that. Um, it has an incredibly detailed uh, weapon database. Um, the game, as I said, is controversial because its sale price is $80 on Steam. And um, that obviously is not terribly common. But what a lot of people don't think about or realize is a database like this, which seems to have almost every single modern uh, weapon in uh, in the inventory of the world uh, since the 1950s, is incredibly valuable in of itself. Now that's not a game for everyone. You know, I'm sure some of you have already tuned out because um, I'm not doing a whole lot so far in terms of the game's concern. So, you know, definitely not something that absolutely everyone will enjoy. But um, if you look through here, I mean, you can see all sorts of different ships, uh, all sorts of different aircraft, um, and all sorts of different, you know, everything you can think of. There's uh, different uh, units. I also believe there are images for some of these. All I have is the base steam installation. I know you can get images in here for a lot of these units as well. So they'll show a picture of what it looks like. Not what I'm looking at right here though. And um, again, just thousands upon thousands of units here. And it's not just that it's listing these units, it has detailed statistics and uh, information. So for example, you get some general data. We're looking at the H1 Super Cobra in 2012, the United States Marine Corps. So you can get a kind of general brief description, its weight, its max payload, its empty weight, its crew, height, uh, average climb rate, um, the generation and its ability, the type of aircraft, uh, the takeoff landing type. But in addition to that, you get a whole breakdown of all these sensors, their abilities, their ranges, any special notes about them. Then you get a, a breakdown of the mounts and the weapon storage. So, you know, the built-in 20 millimeter cannon, uh, rocket mounts, 
and then also different types of uh, weapons that can be used. So it can use Hellfires, it can use a, a newer Hellfire, Sidewinders, tow missiles, and this goes on for thousands of different units. Detailed weapons loadouts of different weapons that these units can be loaded up with, common data link information, signatures. It's basically, if you're someone who's ever looked at like a Jane's combat book, I know I've got a Jane's World War II Warships of the World. This is like that, but all of those for the last 70 years put into one uh, item. So, you know, that in of itself is probably worth the purchase price. You know, a, a book that would cover just the detailed weapons loadouts of, of all the warships in World War II is going to cost you 50, 60 bucks. This covers 70 years. Again, I know the Conway series, I think, which is a, a detailed book of warships, just warships of the world, I think cost like 70, 80 or a hundred dollars or something like that. I don't even know if it's in print anymore. So I mean, that's just for one book. And this game has an entire database with all of that information just all stacked together. So um, that in of itself, if you're the type of person who kind of fancies being um, a wannabe CIA agent or just interested in anything military technology wise, uh, the game might be worth just picking up for the database. But before you know, I bore you too much, if you're still sticking with me here, why don't we actually jump into taking a look at the game? So I'm gonna quickly go over what my strategy is going to be. I know there's SA-4s and there's SA-10 missiles. So actually, uh, let's go back into the database because we, we know what an SA-5 is here. An SA-5 is, uh, we were just looking at that. I can't find it. Okay, there it is. So we look at an SA-5 and we can see here that it um, doesn't have a crew. It is a building, so it's not mobile. Uh, it has, it, it's again, um, it has some assault guns that are with it, some buildings, um, single rail launchers, but there's no armor, uh, there's no capability to move. It's not a mobile SAM site, it's a fixed SAM site. So we know that one is fixed in place. But if we look for the S300, if I can scroll down here and find it somewhere, um, well, I can actually just, there we go. We can just type in here in this filter and we can find it. So if we look at the S300, um, that one is a vehicle component dispersal radius. So I think that means it's a, a mobile unit. Um, again, I'm not a genius with this. I haven't played this game a whole lot, but um, let's take a look here. So it's got, oh, I'm looking at a building, but I know that there's a mobile version of it. So it kind of depends. There's a whole bunch of different variants of the S300 as well. Uh, where are we looking? Let's see here. Come on, we don't even know exactly which version of it. Um, Vietnam, Algeria, China, Venezuela. All right, so we're not sure exactly which version of it that they've got. Um, but I know for a fact myself that the S300 is a mobile unit. Um, so we scroll down. Well, it even says here that it's a vehicle, vehicle, I say tell. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of information here that isn't always necessarily readily um, understandable, but I know with the because I've seen the picture version of it before that it is a mobile SAM. I believe the S, uh, SA-4 is as well. Actually, if we look up the SA-10, maybe it'll, maybe it'll pull up here. Hmm. Tell maybe means vehicle. I'm not sure. But anyway, so the SA-10 is mobile. I think the SA-4 is mobile as well. I want to say it is. If only because I can't see it. It is. It does say it has a vehicle here. And there's no buildings involved. You know, you don't see any radar complexes or buildings or anything like that. Um, so again, pretty certain that it's a, a vehicle of some sort. Um, I've played this scenario once or twice before, so I know it is. It says it's thin skin, so again, oh, here we go, category, mobile vehicle. I was just staring at it right there in front of me. So the SA-4 is a mobile vehicle. Um, so we can't see it on here because we don't know exactly where it is. Fixed locations, you know, we're given a lot of them, but we don't know where everything is on the map. Most likely the SA-10 and the SA-4, which are mobile. So it kind of comes down to what do we want our strategy to be here? You know, if we don't have a... 
if we don't have a knowledge of where everything is, I'm not sure if it's the best strategy, but I'm thinking what we may want to do is we may want to take out these radar sites. There's quite a few of them. You can see there's, what, one, two, three, probably at least, at least a dozen radar sites here that maybe we want to try and take out. The reason for that is if we take out the enemy radars, then it's going to be a lot harder for mobile sites to remain hidden because the big advantage that an SA-10 or an SA-4 has over our equipment is that they don't have to turn the radars on. They can communicate with these other radars here and those radars can feed them a picture of the battlefield, basically tell them where to launch and then they can just wait to turn the radars on till they actually launch and they can kind of be semi-passive and shut the radar off, turn it on, shut it off. So they really don't need to give them away their position but if they turn the radar on, that radar wave is going to go out and it's going to get detected by sensors that we would have uh, to allow us to detect it. So again, my main strategy here initially I think it may not be the best move but because the only target I have is near Baku uh, that I can try and destroy the SA-5s I think it makes more sense to just try and take out the enemy radars first. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna move north and we can see um, that uh, we've got an SS-26 Stone Islander Tell that is a mobile um, SAM site essentially so what we want to do is we're gonna plot a course for that thing we're gonna get a little bit closer um, to uh, to the enemy, uh, hopefully, so we can try and, um, I wonder, maybe it would be, I don't know if they have, I don't know, but, uh, so we can try and get a little bit closer to the enemy, give them less warning time here, so we're going to do that first, and while we're doing that, we're going to move up here, you can see we've got a whole bunch of different items ourselves, here are the Armenian, uh, SAM sites as well, so we've got pretty good protection over here. We've also got some air bases, um, so that one doesn't have any aircraft here. But if we take a look, again, I'm doing a bad job of showing this game off, guys. Um, if you are interested in this game and you think I'm boring, check out Belugan Campaign on YouTube. He does a great job of, of showing this game off and is just a really knowledgeable guy to, to find out uh, information about this game. Definitely worth checking his stuff out. Very, very talented, uh, great guy. Uh, and also you can check out his website, belugancampaign.com. He's got a Belugan campaign form over there. He's also got a chat room where there's always people there willing to check you know, check you out in terms of helping you out uh, with regards to this game. And um, just uh, also, what else? He's got his own YouTube channel. He's got like 30 episodes of this game up there. So certainly stuff to check out. That's Belugan campaign on youtube.com. B-A-L-O. O-G-A-N campaign, all one word. Um, he's also on Twitter as well. So why don't you check him out there and ask any questions you might have. But as you can see here, we just click on the airbase. We can see we've got 16 MiG-29 S fulcrums here that we can use. Now these are mainly air-to-air. -air. They don't have any air-to-ground loadouts here. Um, you can see we've got, what, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 of them are available uh, for use. We've got four that are unavailable. I think I did the math wrong there. I think it's 12, but anyway. So we've got that airbase here. We can use those aircraft. And then we've got several other air bases that we can land aircraft at. You can see here an Araboli aircraft. We have some more MiG-29s, but we also have some S-25 Frogfoots. They're sitting ducks in the air, so you probably don't want to launch them up to take out the enemy uh, with all their uh, missile uh, platforms in place, but they are pretty reasonably good air-to-ground strike aircraft, um, much in the vein of the A-10 Warthog. It's kind of the Soviet Union's tank killer, if you will, um, and uh, a really good strike aircraft, although, like I said, a sitting duck. So MiG-29s and MiG-25s, the main aircraft we have here, I think we'll use those mainly for keeping Armenia safe if the enemy scrambles any of their own aircraft. Uh, what I'd really like to do, I know we've got some uh, aircraft here, we can see we've got some Su-27 flankers, which are some really nice quality fighter aircraft, probably comparable to the F-15. We've got two IL-78 Midas. Those are tankers, as you can see here. So they're mid-air refueling aircraft to give us a little bit longer range. Some Su-34 fullbacks. These are strike aircraft, so those will probably come in handy um, once we uh, once we start taking out enemy targets. Uh, some more Su-24 fencers, which again are strike aircraft. Um, and then we've also got uh, a couple of 
ECMs. These are jamming aircraft, so they're specialized in basically blocking enemy radar signals, filling them with a whole bunch of unreadable um, you know, icons. So basically it makes it more difficult for the enemy to pick you up on radar. Certainly a good weapon to have. And then up north here at Engels Air Base, we have some more mainstays, which are early warning radar, uh, a couple of bears, backfires, blackjacks, and backfires. Now the backfire is a recon, so basically um, it's kind of, uh, you can fly it in low, You can it's got a side looking radar, uh, you can use it to detect targets, very valuable, also a sitting duck. And then you've also got uh, these six different bombers, the backfires, the bears, uh, and the blackjacks, which all have AS, uh, which means air to surface weapons. So the AS4 Kitchen Mod 3, the KH-101, and the AS-15 Kent. So those are all surfaced air missiles. And that's what we're going to start with first. So we're going to practice here launching a strike uh, before this first part of this uh, video series ends. We're going to go ahead and highlight both of these. And we're going to launch them as a group. They're carrying AS-15 Kent missiles. So actually what we might want to do is we might want to find out a little bit more about that weapon. So what we can do down here is we can actually click here. It'll tell us that the, in, this individual weapon, this individual aircraft carries 12 AS-15 Kent weapons. Internal means they're in a bomb bay. We've got some available in the magazines, which means we've probably got enough to reload these each once. So this one flight won't be the only sortie we can launch with this bomber. And um, it gives you general overviews. So the S-15 Kent is an air-launched, turbofan-powered, subsonic, fuel, solid-fuel cruise missile. It carries a 410-kilogram warhead. Uh, it can be launched from both high and low altitude. And that gives you an overview. It also gives you some sources about the uh, weapon itself and then some more information. So the important thing that we want to look at right now, it's subsonic, so that's not ideal if we're trying to sneak up on enemy targets. But the other important thing we want to look at is what is its range? Because if we're going to be trying to take out these targets, we need to know if we can hit them. 1,600 nautical miles. That's a pretty darn long, damn darn, that's a really long range weapon. Um, I know there's a, let's see here, there is a way that you can basically throw a scale into this game and you can go ahead and, um, there's so many different things, but you can go ahead and, and find out basically what the range of an individual um, item is. And I should really know that. I'm going to look at the relief layers. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. So I don't, you can also bring in custom layers, by the way, might as well mention it. You can overlay Google Maps on top of this stuff if you want like actual high quality satellite maps. So that's a pretty darn cool feature. Um, range, reference point, target vectors, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I know 1600 miles is quite a long range. I don't know where the scale is offhand. I should know that if I'm showing this game off. Look, we turned relief layers on so it lets us see the terrain. So you get a little bit more of a colorful map. But uh, yeah, so what we're going to do, we're going to launch those uh, those aircraft at angles. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and I think we already grouped. No, actually we didn't. Um, but also let's take a look at our other weapons. We've got AS4 Kent's. Uh, or kitchens. Uh, these have a much shorter range, only 300 nautical miles. So we're probably going to hold off on launching them at the moment. And then we've also got um, some AS-15 Kents, uh, which have a 1600 nautical mile range. Is that the first one I looked at? I think it might have might have been. The KH-101. Sorry, they have a 1600. Well, those two both have 1600 nautical mile ranges. So we're going to go ahead and launch uh, two, our two bear bombers. We're also going to go ahead and launch our two um, blackjacks, basically uh, the four bombers that we have that can um, basically get get in range of the enemy here um, from a distance without really any risk to our bombers. So meanwhile, while we're waiting for those to get airborne, we're also going to go ahead and send our TEL uh, missile system in uh, to get a little bit closer, and um, we'll go ahead and start here. So you can see here the game plays in real time. Uh, now in this case, we may not want to necessarily wait uh, for all everything that we've already ordered to happen, which is only a couple of things. So we can actually fast forward here um, just by putting our you know our mouse cursor over one of these times. It quickly jumps to that speed. So you can see here we're already 15 minutes in, and you can go all the way up to times 18 th eight, 
1800, uh, which would jump us ahead to 30 minutes a second. That would be a little bit quick. But uh, you can see here, we're just waiting for these aircraft to get airborne, uh, and we're waiting for, um, actually, we are not waiting for these aircraft to get airborne. They are airborne. All right, so you can see here we've got a group. Uh, we can go ahead and give the unit orders. We can plot their course. And the MA radar detection range goes out to about here, so they'll be pretty safe as long as they stay outside of that radar range. So we'll go ahead and order this first group of these back blackjacks uh, over there. We can also rename a lot of these types of things. A lot of these types of units, we can go ahead and rename them. We can also issue a whole lot of commands. Uh, groups can have doctrines. They can have um, uh, different radar settings. So right now uh, we're having the group have passive radar, OECM, and sonar, which basically means they're not going to turn on the radar, which will keep them hidden from the enemy. And uh, obviously that's what we want to do, right? So, um, you can even use nuclear weapons, but we don't have any currently on map. Although you can import weapons if that's what you want to, to do. Oops. I should not be telling them to plot. Um, I need to zoom in here. So we just gave them a funky uh, plot. So we're going to give them a new plot here. Again, we'll go to about there. We're going to go ahead and give this other group here similar orders. We're going to plot them to basically the same place. Put them over here. Again, just want to keep them out of radar range. Uh, well, it looks like we're actually going to send them into radar range, but we can stop that before they get there. Meanwhile, we're waiting on the TELs to get into place. My main goal is going to be to launch some cruise missiles at these enemy installations, and then we'll also go ahead and um, once we've got uh, those cruise missiles launched, once they get kind of closer, we'll launch this surface-to-surface missile, surface -surface missile battery at some of these targets as well. Uh, meanwhile, since we uh, don't really have anything else to do, we're going to go ahead and speed time up again until these bombers get closer to uh, to their destinations there. So as we've got them set to times 30, you can see uh, that the different units have different speeds. Um, we'll slow that down a little bit. And uh, you can see these guys are moving at about 350 knots, just a standard cruising speed. These guys are moving about 250 knots. So, you know, again, fairly standard cruising speeds uh, for different types of bombers. They have different speeds, different um, personalities. You know, the Bear Bomber is a, a turboprop aircraft. Um, in some senses, maybe similar to a World War II bomber, uh, while the uh, Blackjack uses a, a jet engine, so it's a, it's a quicker aircraft. Uh, the Bear uh, was used a lot for maritime uh, support. Actually, the Blackjack was more of a... They were both strategic bombers, um, but uh, the, the Blackjack probably had a, a more realistic chance of survival. We're going to go ahead and uh, just give this a little bit of time. I kind of brought out the Blackjacks uh, to that kind of side course to buy a little bit of time so we can get these guys roughly into the same position at about the same time. So you can see here we've got these guys moving into position and um, at this point in time I'm going to go ahead and see about launching uh, my missiles at the enemy. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's go ahead and um, take a look at our unit orders. We want to go ahead and attack options. We're going to choose manual. You can give the units auto attack orders in which the computer chooses to launch where it wants, where it sees fit. But we're going to do it manually. So what we'll do here is the first target we're going to choose, we've got, what, like 20 missiles? I think we'll assign maybe three missiles or four missiles to each target, um, just as sort of good measure. And uh, we'll start with this first radar here. Uh, whoa. Start with this first radar here. We're going to take out one radar here. We'll take out the black nut, the tin shield, uh, the radar bar lock, and then the radar spoon rest. So go ahead and take out the black nut. Uh, this one bear has eight weapons. It can fire. Uh, we'll actually just allocate, let's say, three. So we just choose the number we want to allocate to that target. We just go ahead and hit allocate. And uh, you can see here it's going to fire three on that target. So three. And there's a sound effect there. You can turn those off or on or whatever. But we've got three launching there. And then again, if we... Oh, 
Let's turn off the missile. Fire. Okay. So we're going to turn off the missile sounds. By the way, there's a number three that shows up next to this radar. That's because we've got a three targets assigned to it. And actually, I, th I really hope we chose the black nut. So we're there's two radar installations here. There's a tall king and a black nut. They're two different types of radar, a P-80 and a P-14. We're going to go ahead and assign three weapons to the uh, tall king. We're just, or actually no, we're just going to assign two here. So uh, go ahead and do that. So we've got five missiles incoming on these two different targets there. You can see it kind of overlays a little bit difficult to see. Um, but there you go. So we've got five coming in there. Oh, there's an SA-5 battery there. I would have just fired on them if I'd known. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So if I'd known there was an SA-5 battery there, I might not have wasted my missiles on the radars. I might have just gone straight for the uh, for the SA-5s if I had known that we had two of our, our mission objectives on screen. But anyway, so we're going to go ahead and keep keep uh, focusing our targets on the enemy radar installations. Looks like we've got a tin shield here. Um, we'll go ahead and attack that. We've got three more missiles we can allocate, so we'll go ahead and do that. So that one bomber's eight missiles are all allocated um, against this target here. And then we're going to go ahead and now target the radar bar lock, uh, if you will. That's another type of radar. And now we did use up all of the missiles from that one bomber, but remember each group has two bombers in it, so we do have eight more of these missiles to allocate. Because um, it's more remote and further up, we're only going to allocate two. I'm hoping uh, that these are sufficient to destroy these radars. I'm being a little bit conservative with my uh, with my targeting here. You know, all it takes is essentially a couple of failed or enemy missile launches to intercept us to uh, prevent us from, you know, destroying these targets. But, um, hey, hopefully it's enough. Did I? I'm confused. Oh, no, these aren't in the air yet. That's why it's, uh, the numbers don't update till the, till the weapons are in the air. We got another radar location over here that we want to take out. Again, no weapons are assigned to it yet. I'm guessing that this isn't going to be enough and there's going to be enemy weapons that are going to intercept our missiles. Um, or something like that, but uh, we'll see. So we've got those all assigned. I think we'll go ahead and assign our other missiles now as well. Again, we're taking kind of the long, tedious route for this, but uh, it's not the route you have to go. You don't have to manually target everything. Just what I'm choosing to do. You can see now that we've uh, launched these missiles from this aircraft. We can zoom in here. And we can see that these missiles are all showing up as uh, as individually plotted units here. You can see their vectors are these lines represented on the screen. And uh, you've got uh, these KH-101s. Meanwhile, the group is returning to base now that it's out of weapons. Uh, it has no units left or it has no weapons left, so it is disbanding. Um, so that group is doing that. Meanwhile, our other group here is ready to launch its weapons. Um, this isn't a terribly coordinated strike, but... Uh, you know, it's something. So we're going to go ahead and allocate our weapons for this group. They've got a little bit longer to fly. They're probably more likely to get intercepted. But we're going to continue striking or attempting to strike enemy radar installations. So we've got a couple of radars here, actually. We've got um, a tin shield and spoon rest. Oh, no. Outside the bore sites. Actually, I don't think that matters. Yes, bore sights don't matter. That's just like if you're trying to aim manually, I believe. So we're allocating two, and I don't even know which one we're waiting for. So we're just going to fast forward five seconds real quick. There we go. So we've got two weapons uh, incoming on that one. We'll go ahead and launch on this. We'll put two more in on that. Again, I'm being really conservative with my um, targeting. We've got more radars here. Um, I do I'm not going to take these all out. You know, the thing about cruise missiles, especially the ones that I'm firing, is they're actually pretty slow, and they're pretty easy targets for an SA-5, or especially an SA-10. The SA-10 is like the Russian Patriot missile almost, except it's actually a little bit a little bit better in the sense that it's the Patriot has a lot of design limitations um, because it's designed heavily around um, missile intercepts versus air-to-air, -air. and the SA-10 is actually a pretty formidable weapon uh, for dealing with both types of targets here. So as you can see, we're using up our missile supply here slowly but surely. Um, and 
I think that just about does it for the uh, for the radars. I think we've got one more radar down here. Pardon my keyboard. I got a mechanical keyboard, and uh, it's kind of annoying, honestly, and how loud it is. Um, definitely, I'm sure it's gonna show up on the uh, on the recording here. So I apologize for that. I need to figure out what I'm gonna do with that. So we've assigned those missiles there, and then I think what we're gonna do is, in the interest of maybe hopefully overwhelming, you know, the enemy enemy is gonna be launching missiles all over. So I think what we may want to do is we may want to launch the rest of these weapons here on this SA-5 target. Um, hopefully maybe getting some some kills and, and getting some victory points for destroying our target. So we're going to launch these four here on that SA-5. And then we'll go ahead and launch two of these guys' missiles on the SA-5. So we've got six missiles coming in on that SA-5 unit. They've got 22 targets there, so we probably won't destroy the whole thing. Um, but, you know, we've got a chance of at least disrupting them. Meanwhile, we do have one more radar we haven't targeted yet, so we're going to go ahead and quickly get that radar targeted. And um, got two more here that we can launch. We'll do that. And then the other six that we have, we're going to launch at this SA-5 target. The SA-5 does have anti-ballistic missile capabilities as well, so it will probably shoot down... Where is the SA-5? Here. It will probably shoot down the majority of these missiles, um, but it's at least going to make the enemy waste their ammunition against us. Um, yeah. So I think we've got all of these targets targeted. I think. And uh, now it's just kind of a, a waiting game. As we can see, we've got all of these vectors in. Again, I'm going to launch the SS-26, uh, which is a surface-to-surface -surface missile, which I believe is actually having quite a bit of action in um, the current conflict in Ukraine. Um, it's being used quite extensively. But uh, we're going to go ahead and just wait till these things get a little bit closer because the SS-20 is a very fast ballistic missile type thing. These are all slow cruise missiles. So I want to make sure that they're closer in to their targets before we use those up because again they're going to get to their targets much more quickly. You can see our cruise missiles here closing in on their targets and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually launch my SS-26 um, surface-to-surface -surface missiles. I'm going to launch them against the SA-5 targets um, to try and maximize my diversions here. So these are getting close. So we've only got, what, we've got eight of these SS-26s. Uh, we're going to launch four against each of those tar each of those SS-5 surface-to-air missiles that we're aware of. We'll go ahead and launch four here. And it probably won't destroy anything, but... Uh, Still, it, it'll, or I mean, it'll, it'll hopefully, some of them will strike for home, hopefully, but it, it'll, it won't totally destroy the unit. It'll just destroy some of it. So we can uh, fire four against that. So we've got all of those being fired off here shortly. You can see these missiles are closing in. Now, hopefully the terrain makes them hard to intercept as well. They're flying over mountains. Uh, They're flying at... Uh, what is their altitude here? We can see their altitude is 7,000 feet, 60 feet AGL, so 60 feet above uh, the map of the Earth. They're uh, terrain-hugging cruise missiles here. And um, just as a heads up, I'm, I'm probably going to cut the video off here, uh, and we'll wait for the strike here on our next turn. So um, check out part two, where I'll go ahead and just kind of pick this right directly up. I might put this all in the same video, so if I don't, you know, sorry, but uh, I may split it up. So if this is in two different videos, welcome to part two. If not, we're still in part one. <laughs> so you can see these are coming in at low earth uh, altitudes here. Now, I may have shot these off too soon. These are quickly gaining speed. You can see over 2,500 knots now um, and over 8,000 feet. So these are going to show up on enemy radars right away, over 90,000 feet as they kind of head into space. Um, so they're, they're going to show up on enemy radar right away. I may have wanted to wait until these uh, missiles got a little bit closer because at 60 feet AGL, it's a fair bet the enemy radar has not picked them up yet, at least not along this mountain range, which should act as a nice shield uh, for these missiles coming in to remain somewhat undetected, hopefully anyway. 
But uh, at the very least, my hope is that the enemy wastes some of their weapons against our uh, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, maybe enough so that they're stuck in kind of a reloading uh, state when, um, when these missiles come in. But uh, I guess we'll see how this all plays out here very shortly. Uh, you can see here we've kind of got almost two waves because of the way I launched these. I didn't coordinate the strikes all that well. Um, and uh, these may be sea skimming missiles, but they're also coming in over the water, so they're probably detected. It's a pretty flat terrain here between the peninsula. And these radar sites may have picked them up already, kind of getting around the mountains. But uh, you can see here these are 4,000 knots. Uh, feel over 50 or over 80 kilometers, so they're definitely in space. Um, they're like ballistic missiles, but with conventional weapons and highly accurate uh, as they uh, come down here. So we should be getting some results here very shortly. I would anticipate the enemy launching surface-to-air missiles against these rapidly incoming anti-ballistic uh, or against these ballistic missiles. They're going to be much more difficult to shoot down than the uh, cruise missiles coming in behind them. But uh, the SA-10 is certainly capable of it, and the SA-5 maybe as well. Um, we know the enemy has some SA-5s. We don't know where the SA-10s are. So we can see these coming in. The S uh, S-26 Stone RV reentry vehicle penetrator. Um, you can see here it's up to 100 kilometers. It's now begun its descent as it starts to close in on its target. And um, yeah, so we'll see here. Again, mainly a standoff weapon attack as it's closing down here, down toward 80 kilometers, and uh, it's slowing as it re-enters the atmosphere of the Earth. The uh, atmosphere begins to get a little more dense, meeting more friction. By the way, I didn't mention it earlier, but this red kind of haze over here with locks is a no-fly no zone over Georgia. So uh, apparently Russia is more like the United States in this scenario in that it's trying to pretend it cares about... Um, about international rules, laws, and sovereignty, and all that in this scenario. Similar, the Russians are, um, you, you want to, you're caring about your losses, which I don't think the Russians traditionally do, but uh, we can see here the uh, missile is closing in on its target here. It's down to about, uh, what, 150,000 feet as it's rapidly descending in on its target here. There's, what, four of them, I believe, and um, so far no hits against it. So you can see we got uh, the SS-26 stone. First one missed its target, second one missed its target, third one missed its target, and the fourth one missed its target. They all missed? Missed SA-5 single rail by 33 feet. The target disappeared off our scanners, though. So we may have actually destroyed it. Now it says the uh, Russian score points has been fired, so... We can actually cheat a little bit here if we want. Now, it does say that war footing has uh, been enabled, which basically means that the uh, Azerbaijani are now aware that we are at war with them, essentially. So there's, they may have been caught flat-footed there where they weren't expecting those attacks, um, but now, obviously, they are. If we take a look at the scoring, we can see losses and expenditures. Uh, the Azerbaijani side lost 12 SA-5s. This might be a little bit gamey looking at what they what they lost because this is, you know, without fog of war. But the enemy lost here 12 SA-5 game and single rails. Uh, one building, two buildings, one building. So I guess the four missiles was more than enough. Now, unfortunately, we've got some cruise missiles assigned to that target, um, and they're not going to have anywhere to fly to, so those are wasted. But um, definitely nice that we took out an enemy SA-5 battery uh, pretty darn quick without... Uh, Without any issues, so that's nice to see. We've got the other four SS-26 RV penetrators are coming in here on the other side uh, rapidly, and we've got the cruise missiles coming in as well. I'd speed it up, but I want to wait for this uh, SA SS-26 to come in because this is going to be coming in within the next few seconds. I would assume we're going to see some stuff showing up here, saying the enemy's engaging it, and uh, there we go. Uh, an SA-20 gargoyle is attacking an SS-26, and it hit hit, um, miss, and a hit. So a miss and a hit. So you can see there, the enemy actually destroyed all four of ours. Looks like they fired off at least six SA-20 uh, gargoyles, which are, um, I believe the SA-20 is an S-300. Well, I thought... Anyway, so they shot down those ballistic missiles of ours, unfortunately. 
But they did fire off, what, six, eight of their own missiles to destroy four of ours. Um, what is the SA-20? We can see losses and expenditures here. Uh, the Azerbaijanis expended 20 SA-20Bs. So if we're not sure what that is, what we can actually do is we can go ahead and pull up the database viewer and then search SA-20B. Oh, it's not going to be under aircraft. It's going to be under weapon. So SA-20B. It is a S-300. So, okay, actually, these are S-300s. I thought that would be the SA-10, but it might be their export variant. Uh, in any case, it's a guided weapon. And... Um, that's what they uh, used against us here. So it's uh, one of the things we need to destroy. But at the very least, they used up their missiles, uh, or some of them, on them. So we've got these other cruise missiles incoming here. We're going to go ahead and speed things up a bit as uh, we wait for these to income. In income. Now we can er, come in. We can see the enemy scrambled bogeys. These are most likely enemy fighter jets, probably MiG-29s, which are now showing up on our radars, probably going to try and shoot down these cruise missiles, which they shouldn't have too much difficulty in doing because they are slow flying uh, weapons. You can see here the enemy bogey has been confirmed as hostile. When they're unidentified, they are yellow. When they're hostile, they turn to red, and um, our radars are picking them up. So they're going to come in on these cruise missiles and probably shoot them down. Again, they're only moving at a couple hundred knots. So uh, you can see they're attacking these with surface-to-air missiles. That's what these little updates on the right-hand side are. I'd rather they shoot down the ones headed to this blank target. But uh, you can see a miss, a hit, um, a hit, and a hit. So um, they are destroying our surface-to-air missiles here with their own aircraft. Um, again, we can kind of speed things up here. We've got some missiles that are about to come in on the left side or on the west we've, against this radar, this kind of isolated radar site. Mainly the AA-11 archers have been fired also, which are hitting, and uh, those are surfaced air, those are air-to-air -air missiles. The AA-10 is kind of like the U.S., um, um, I guess, U.S., I don't know if it's really like a AMRAM, but it's kind of probably at least like a Sparrow. Whereas the AA-11, I believe, is kind of their short range, like a Sidewinder missile. So we've got these two missiles that are coming in. Again, it's just kind of waiting to see what happens. Two cruise missiles coming on the spoon-fed radar. The no-fly zone doesn't affect our weapons, by the way. And uh, you can see here we took out that enemy radar installation. So another enemy target is destroyed. Um, it looks like we still got two missiles coming in on one of these radar sites, so they may have shot down some of our stuff, but uh, not everything. At least they may have fired off all their weapons as well, or at least that one aircraft did. We saw there were two enemy units that were scrambled, but they've also got more fighter jets up here. thing is, we can't just fly our fighters over here, because with all these surface-to-air missiles, they're going to be sitting ducks. So uh, we took another one off, or took another enemy unit off, and... Uh, Go ahead and speed things up a bit. We can see our weapons coming in. The enemy has quite a few aircraft in the air, scrambled. And uh, we're just kind of speeding through this now. And uh, you can see they're picking off our surface or air-to-surface missiles uh, pretty easily there. Um, looks like they destroyed almost everything here over the middle of the map. Um, we did hit a few of our targets, though. So... We've also got these missiles still coming in on the SA-5 battery near Baku. Uh, I don't know if we've got enough there to take it out, but at the very least they're coming in. And again, I, one of the, my favorite things to always do is take a look at the expenditures. So the enemy has lost a few more units here, a few more radars, um, but they've also fired off over 40 air-to-air -air missiles. And that's one other thing, is there's a limited number of weapons you saw that we have to choose from on our own end. The enemy also has a limited number of weapons to use on their end. Uh, I don't know what their air-to-air -air missiles are. They probably have quite a few, but uh, they are using up their weapons and, and destroying our own. So they're any, you know, it's it's a trade-off. Their magazines aren't unlimited, and I, I'm not sure how much Armenia has to shoot off, um, but again, 40 air-to-air -air missiles is not insignificant. We can see the enemy has launched some SA-20 gargoyles up against our uh, other cruise missiles here toward Baku. You can see there were two that popped up here. One is a hit, one is a miss, and uh, we're going to kind of speed this up. We took out another one. They're down to two, down to one. 
And at least that last one did get in and destroy the enemy radar facility there. So, we've had some success. We'll see. We've only got a few more missiles in the air. Um, they're headed toward this kind of remote, isolated, and I believe this is where the whole conflict is over this. It's hard to see in the map that I'm currently showing you. What I'll, I'll do here is I'll get rid of that relief layer, and that should, should help. There we go back to that non-topographical map, or, or less... Obvious so. And this little region here, I believe, is the area for dispute. This part is, is currently controlled by Ar by uh, Azerbaijan here. They control this little section here, but it's behind Armenian lines, and Armenia claims it. So that's really what this dispute is over. And uh, again, if we go ahead and we check back and look at the expenditures, the enemy has used some 60, no, 50 air to air missiles. So that's nice. They've also used up almost 20 of their SA-20s. I believe they've only got like 60 of them total, so uh, if they've got two batteries, um, they've got like 32 per battery, so it's quite a heavy expenditure of their weapons already. Um, so that's a good thing for us. I don't know if they have reloads or anything, but we'll wait for this one to come in. And hit. So... Um, again, we can see that uh, that radar site was taken out. Now, I don't know if striking the enemy radar facilities was the best strategy. You can see here, I really didn't hit anything in the south. They intercepted almost all these missiles. They've still got uh, radar here, here, here. They've got one more near Baku, um, and they've got uh, at least one, maybe two up near this radar, this airfield. Um, so they've got, you know, we took out a good chunk of the enemy radars on the north. You can see here the radar coverage isn't too um, diminished because they have so many radar sites. Um, and also keep in mind that a lot of the surface-to-air missile sites also have radar sites. Nonetheless, um, it's thinning the enemy out here. Uh, one of the nice things is, like, this SA-3 does have its own radar, but you can see its range is pretty limited. So by ignoring the SA-3s and 2s, we're really, you know, we can fly around these. We can fly around these narrow missile corridors. And the fact that we took out the one SA-5 here in the middle, you can see the enemy, what we know about the enemy radar range, or enemy um, surface-to-air missiles, this is this red oval here. So this used to expand all the way out here. Now it's much shorter. Now we can fly theoretically all the way here and launch our weapons against the enemy. Now that's probably not all that accurate because of the fact that we know the enemy has SA-10s out there with their radars off. So we'd need to pick up on them. It might have been wise when I had my missiles coming in to send one of those Eland aircraft, the electronic warfare aircraft, based on, uh, where are they based here? Is that it? Yeah, an Eland pod. Might have been wise to launch that up. We could have probably picked up where the enemy weapons were located. Um, but I'm not great at this game. So basically we've gone ahead and we've launched our first strike here against, uh, against the enemy. And... Um, haven't lost anything because it was all cruise missiles. Uh, we fired off half of our cruise missile stock. We've got enough for one reload, I believe, everywhere, uh, pretty much. And uh, if we look at the losses and expenditures, uh, you know, Armenia, which is our side, has lost nothing. Uh, Russia has lost nothing. Uh, we have expended some 40 cruise missiles and um, some 8... Actually... Penetrators, penetrators. That's 16 SS-26 stones. Did they destroy those? Oh, no, they're still there. That's weird. Um, but anyway, so these guys are all out of ammo. They don't have any extra any weapons. And I don't think any of our, our magazines here have any SS-26s. So I'm pretty sure that's all we've got of that, unfortunately. Um, but again, so we... Uh, we fired off a good deal of cruise missiles. I have to feel Russia's got the advantage in terms of how many weapons they can they can use. Um, destroyed quite a few radar facilities and uh, made the enemy shoot off over over almost 80 missiles. So at least in that sense, um, it was a heavy first wave, and uh, we uh, destroyed one of their SA-5 batteries. We've got another SA-5 battery still to deal with near Baku. If we can take that out, then things start to get a little bit easier. Uh, we still want to take out that tin shield radar as well. I would imagine the enemy has enough missiles to reload uh, a few times. Um, unfortunately, if we look at the magazines here, uh, we don't have that many spare missiles in reserve, but uh, the enemy probably has at least that. So uh, we probably uh, shrunk 
their um, weapon inventory, um, but obviously didn't totally degrade it. Now, these enemy aircraft are kind of kind of coming close to our our um, own air defenses. So I think what I'm gonna do. Can I scramble some fighters? Why don't we go ahead and scramble up some fighter aircraft? We'll go ahead and get four uh, fighter aircraft up into the air, taxiing to take off. They're on a two-minute ready alert. So we'll go ahead and get them in the air as a fighter group. Maybe we can knock out these enemy aircraft. That would be nice. Engage in some air-to-air -air combat. So we're going to go ahead and accelerate things a bit. Okay, so we've got this group here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, plot these guys out this direction. We'll see what happens. We're just going to send them out there on cruise. And uh, I'm thinking we might be able to attack. No directors are able to illuminate this target. Insufficient reflection, no line of sight. So this is where an, a uh, AWACS aircraft would certainly come in handy. What we can do is we can switch it to auto, let the computer decide. I'm going to mark this as a bogey. We'll see. Oops. I didn't actually do that. Okay. Now we've also got um, enemy fire control radar surface to air medium range. So it looks like the enemy has mobile units here. Now these may be SA-10s or SA-4s. Um, the enemy could be, again, um, having its mobile launchers here. Uh, we're picking up, that's what these little kind of orange triangles reflect as we're picking up radar reflections off that direction. So we got to be careful, you know, we don't want to get our aircraft destroyed. But uh, our own aircraft are kind of moving forward and engaging. So you can see here, we accelerated a bit. They fired their own AA-10 Alamo missiles at this uh, enemy multi-role fighter, which we've identified as being a hostile. And it hit an enemy MiG-29 Fulcrum, so uh, we can confirm that target destroyed. We've got another enemy multi-role aircraft here that we're going to target. Our group of four Fulcrums is going to go ahead and fire off its missiles. Uh, more AA-10 Alamos. The enemy probably will try and fire off something of its own, but I think I'm going to pull our own new contact detected by radar tin shield. Vampire. Okay, that's a pop-up. Okay, so the enemy has launched its own air-to-air -air missiles against us. So we are under attack. The game automatically paused us there, so that's interesting. That's new. And um, hopefully our missiles close range with the enemy. I don't know if these are remotely guided or if... I guess they must not be. You know... Another vampire detected. So we've got enemy air, air enemy air to air missiles are incoming fast and furious here. As uh, we can see, yes, we got one hit. Okay. So now what we want to do is quickly order these guys to RTB. Um. Disengage, drop all targets, and RTB, can we do that? We'll go ahead and RTB them. Also, I wonder if we can get them out of there quickly. I guess we'll see. So we've got one fulcrum here that an enemy vampire is closing in. I'm not sure if these are missiles that can lock on by themselves or what. I guess we'll see here. Or if these missiles simply, after flying blind, um, fail to engage. So you can see here, we're kind of losing these contacts. We don't have direct radar contact. You can see this one is still incoming. One of them missed their target, though, so that's a good sign. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Stay away! Okay, good. That one missed. You RTBing? 
So I guess these missiles do have the ability to follow their targets. They don't appear to be dumb missiles. Although after a certain time, they apparently do self-destruct without any kind of radar guidance. So that was a, a successful strike. You can see the enemy has bogeys incoming trying to scramble in and get revenge, I would assume. So what we want to do is if we can, um, let's go ahead and stop and pause. So now that we ordered these guys home, we can go ahead and throttle them up into afterburners, I guess. Might not be a bad idea. I don't want them to run out of fuel, but I got to imagine they still have quite a bit of fuel. So we'll go ahead and order them to throttle up to afterburners to uh, get the heck out of Dodge before these other enemy fighters that we can see over here come to uh, come to their aid here. So as we throttle up, you can see these uh, fighters speeding up to get out of there. They're quickly accelerating up to over 900 knots. If the enemy tries to chase them, they're going to burn through their fuel quickly. The enemy is not moving anywhere near as quick. They're, well, no, they're moving at 950 knots as well, so the enemy's coming in uh, at afterburners. Now, we've got the same type of aircraft, so it makes sense that they have the same max speed. And uh, at that rate, I don't think the enemy's going to be able to catch... They're at the very fringe of weapons range, and with us running full speed the opposite direction, there's no chance that they would hit them. The only risk is that the enemy has SA-10s here that they're firing off at us, um, but I doubt that that's the case at this point. That was a pretty successful engagement, I would say, for us. Uh, we shot down, I think, two enemy aircraft here. If we go ahead and we look at the losses, we can see uh, uh, we did fire off two SA-4 missiles somewhere at enemy aircraft, SA-4 surface-to-air missiles. That's not... You know, only two, only one missile, maybe two missiles. Meanwhile, we uh, shot down. We can see here at the losses, we shot down two enemy MiG-29 fulcrums, and uh, the enemy has expended even more missiles now. So they had expended what, like 50 before? They're up to 54. Obviously, we shot those aircraft down as well, and uh, we shot five AA-10 Alamos. So we've shot five missiles for the destruction of two aircraft. I would say that's worth it. So uh, we'll get these guys back on the ground. Oh, whoa. Is that guy going to really fly all that way? I guess he's not really flying into the range of anything. Not too close anyway. I was going to scramble more aircraft after him, but uh, he turned away. If I had been paying a a enough attention, then it would have been a good thing to do. But uh, you can see our aircraft kind of loitering there. And there they go into land, and they've both landed. So... Um, two enemy MiG-29s destroyed, several radar sites destroyed, an SA-5 battery destroyed, and um, over the course of about four hours. So I'd say that's, you know, it's certainly not the best first strike that we could have. We've also detected uh, enemy mobile radar sites over here, so we know that the enemy uh, SA-10s are probably in this general direction, the SA-10s and SA-4s. So we know they're located down here. Um, we can't really target them yet because we don't have a fixed position on them. Uh, but, uh, again, we know roughly where they're located. Um, I don't think the enemy has any aircraft at this airbase, but they do have some SAMs in the south. They're a little bit of a, a nuisance. Um, we're not allowed to bomb the enemy airbases. So the fact that we to took out two enemy aircraft in the air, the primary goal is not the destruction of the Azerbaijani Air Force, but really just their surface-to-air missile systems. So we took out one of their two SA-5s. That's a success. I don't know. It looks like they've got at least three of these mobile batteries down here in the south. Um, so that's good to know. And, um, you know, at least, I don't know, a dozen aircraft, I would estimate, maybe more. But again, we did take out two without loss. So I'm pretty pleased about that. Um, I don't know what the score is right now. I guess we only get points for destroying the SAMs. I consider it a victory if we destroy enemy aircraft, though. So uh, as those aircraft landed here, back at this, nope, not that airbase, at this airbase, you can see here we've got, um, these aircraft are readying. It's going to take two hours before they're ready to fly again. This one's still taxing to parking spots. So we've got realistic turnaround times for our aircraft. If we were to zoom out here and head north uh, to Engels Air Force Base, we would see that our bombers have already landed. Um, and we've got... 
these guys didn't launch. These guys are going to be ready in 20 hours. So they only have one more loadout worth of air-to-air uh, -air missiles, or sorry, surface-to-air missiles, and it's going to take almost a full day to get them ready again. So maybe done with strikes for the current time period. Um, I'm going to cut this video off here, though, at this point. I uh, hope it wasn't too boring. Hope this was something that was mildly interesting for you. Uh, like I said, it's a pretty realistic simulation of modern combat. Um, not so much land-to-land -land combat, but air-to-land and sea-to-sea and, -sea and air-to-sea. It's a very realistic simulator. It's got a lot more depth to it than what I've shown. Um, but uh, so far, I'm pleased with uh, what we've got as far as our results. Again, my main goal is to knock out these enemy radar installations so they then have to turn on uh, their radars of their of their surface-to-air weapons and thus give away their specific positions. You know, we can't really launch a surface-to-surface -surface missile strike on question marks. We don't have enough targeting data. Um, but uh, at the very least, you know, maybe they'll use up the majority of their, uh, their surface-to-air missiles. I didn't check to see if... Uh, they launched any more of those other our aircraft at maybe long range. Um, that's Russia. Doesn't look like it's still only the 18 SA-20s. So um, we also use some generic flare salvos. I assume we've got pretty much unlimited ammo of those. And uh, yeah, so all in all, you know, at least a, a bloodless first strike on Azerbaijan. And uh, we'll probably fast forward a bit until we get to our next strike of uh, surface to, or air to surface missiles um, and, and make the enemy spend millions of dollars more trying to shoot them down. But uh, until next time, this is the Historical Gamer. Uh, probably this is part two, I assume, saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.